This is part of the Black Fiber Information Center experience. And, uh, you know, the real experience is varied as they have been across space and time, inherently impinge upon attempts to retrieve, engage, and preserve the Black Fiber. The similar series of examining how the Black experience is problems problems with regards to how they have been represented, as they have encountered enslavement, imperialism, and apartheid. In response, black engagement is sort of complicated what the archive is and what its material and generic manifestations are. A similar series brings together scholars from Africa and the diaspora whose work is found in the 21st century what black archival imagination is and what its possibilities are for creating a talented future. These scholars, archivists, writers, filmmakers, and activists work across genres and media. In ways that present bodies of work with multifarious implications of thinking about the work of black and white education. We would like to acknowledge um, the amazing, the generous, important support this seminar city, uh, folks who are our uh, partners, and they are uh, Duke English. Um, special thanks to Becca, Fonte, Jack, Lisa, Captain Eva, the Africa Initiative, uh, the Front of the Humanities Institute. Um, Proceeding with Southern Africa and let us do African and African aspects. We're grateful for their collaboration. Uh, today's seminar is a meeting, uh, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, and uh, there's a story I want to, a quick story I want to tell um, with an image of the um, Can you get the key? Oh. It's, just a, it's just an image of text so I want to put there. Um, a few years ago, in 2018, I was doing some archival research um, at Emory University. Um, and I, was, I, I was looking at you on UNIA. Uh, but I just I was finishing a book on contemporary African writers, and one of the key parts of the book is the Biafran War and the modernization of African identity. And I came across a box of books from a, a journalist who had covered the Biafran War. And even though I wasn't really interested in that box, I took it up and I just flipped through, and 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 that name just and this is 1967. Um, that name just jumped up. And because Louise and I have um, known each other for almost half a decade at that time, uh, I remember exciting taking a photo and telling me, are you an alien? Is this, is this you in, in, in 1967? Um, you know, what's the story? And, and then he told me that he um, this was his father and he was working on the war at the time. So change change very much. Uh, so I got really excited. I thought I'd, I'd just share how sometimes archives can jump out of, out, out of they can just jump out and be very intimate with the So I'm pretty excited. But today uh, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Luis Chirisoke, who's a writer, a scholar, at Boston University, and directs the African American Science Program. His work includes the award winning The Last Darkly, Bert Williams. Not on Black Minstrels or the African Diaspora, which came out in 2005, Sound of Counter, Diaspora and Black Technologies, which came out in 2015, and the Acclaimed Memoir, which is the subject of our discussion today, closing in a most continuing way, which came out in 2009. His work has appeared in numerous languages, including book translation, book, book translation in Korean, uh, Dr. Satan, Eco, Dr. Satan's Eco Chamber, which is one of the most famous things. And every time I I, I, I mentioned his name, even I didn't think he ignored it. But of course, the science of is reggae technology and the diaspora process of 2022. And in German, race and technology essays on migration in 2023. He's the editor in chief of the Black Scholar, one of the oldest and leading journals of Black South in America. Chiris Ok has collaborated with numerous artists and performers, including iconic Berlin electronic artists. Uh, 
most of models, we do produce them at the celebrated out of an architect, which are the characters in the world, and the legend the beauty joins uh Anzen as company. And we just saw some of their title records um uh in the library in the region area. In the 2022 tour and show curriculum too. He's also founder of the International Sonic Art or Archive Project, Dr. Kitchen. He's a lead artist of curator uh, of sometimes you just have to do it your attention, which is a year-long sound art project which, which won uh, the German Federal, Federal Cultural Foundation work. The album of sound recordings and installations from that project was released this month. Julius Ok was also curator of the Carnegie Hall's 2022 Afrofuturism Festival and the Sky Game Advisor to the Korean Hunt, which is Art and Technology Initiative partnership uh, with Edgy and Friends. His forthcoming book is titled Machines of Death and Jar, How Race Led Technology, coming out with Viking Wagon House Trade and Car. Please welcome the blessing of self and the We will have a reading instead of reading, and then we'll just open it up. Thanks. Thank you, folks, very much. Thank you, Chris. Chris and Kisa for inviting me. <clears throat> also, I want to thank Duke University for being wise enough to hire Chris Oma at Quasi, who's stereo. So, thank you guys for everything in the past, present, and future. And I just want to give a quick shout out to Nate Mackey. Who's here? Very pleased to see my um, mentor and model. I haven't seen this in a long time. It's a great pleasure. So, um, I'm going to be reading today, and I'm thinking of this archival imagination. I'm thinking of the politics of memory, the poetics of remembering. I'm thinking also about the ways in which the archive is the attempt to institutionalize cultural memory, right? Create institutions around remembering, especially for those who either don't want to or don't know how to remember, or those who are prevented from memory, from remembering. Um, those of you who are graduate students and scholars, you probably know that we've taken a big archival turn in terms of contemporary thinking politics, but coming increasingly out of the space of art, art production, cultural memory and archival thinking is really, we're in a major moment in blacks in particular, trying to, trying to remember how to remember. <laughs> to make sense of our own language of memory, which does lead to a memoir, which is what I wrote in 2021, published in 2021. But before I talk about the memoir, I want to read an essay that I wrote, the first thing I wrote after the memoir was published, which is memoir-ish, and it does refer to a section in the memoir that I might read after the essay. I'm reading the essay not only because it speaks directly to the memoir, sections about the memoir, but it's about how so much of our remembering is about our relationship to texts, and narratives, and books. Memory is a more than reading, right? As well as uh, sort of um, bringing back into presence old experiences. It's a way of reading these experiences. So I want to read a short essay. And now the title of the essay didn't do me any favors. The essay is called In Praise of Racist Books. <laughs> but the reason I titled it that was because I wanted to lead to the subtitle. The subtitle is Notes of an Immigrant Reader. <clears throat> so, to give the title, it says Years ago, I began opening my literature classes by declaring that some of my favorite books were racist. It played to the cool black professor pose, but was less transgressive than it seemed because the intellectual climate on college campuses was actually shifting in my favor. After all, mine was a generation emerging to challenge the dead white men of Western culture. We believed that racist books deserved to be called out and their racisms, evident or fake, 
had to be recognized as being important to the Empire's as well as to the world. But I genuinely appreciated those books and had learned much from them. The idea that they shouldn't be taught at all was an end game I naively had not expected. But this was the naivete. It was an era of naivete for those insisting that race, gender, and sexuality were central to knowledge of the world. Naive because we thought that being on the right side of those issues guaranteed us victory during the culture wars. It's now clear that those were just skirmishes, mere rehearsals for battles with still uncertain outcomes. In those days, debates about race were increasingly informed by interpretive modes, first dismissed as identity politics, and now reductively defined and often deliberately misinterpreted as a critical race theory. Cool black professors were who students flocked to for those perspectives, much to the chagrin of our living white male colleagues. It was an exciting time to teach. So many students were genuinely disturbed and excited by having to think about how race, class, sex, and gender shape their experiences and their reading. It's now my turn for chagrin because it's difficult for them to imagine anything else. You see, I learned much more from racist folks than simply their racism. But black scholars weren't just exotic presences on white canvases. We were avatars of transformation. Our confidence was due to a smugness endemic to our unique position in American higher education, privileged because of our rarity and empowered by our ability to affirm powerlessness. I started noticing a, noticing a shift in what black professors began to mean. Between dissertation and tenure, the black professor was no longer transgressive despite our radical theories postures. We become so comfortable in thinking of ourselves as intellectual outsiders that we miss our migration to the center. Students were no longer shocked by us or our ideas, but came instead to learn how to avoid transgression. So when one student declared to me, Professor, I'm just here to make sure I'm on the right side, I was devastated. I've never been good to be on the right side. I've lived by Joan Dickens ever being dictum, and you are always sent sometimes. But that vision of writing came not from Gideon or other literary snitches or setups. They came from racist books, kind of reader for me. My affection for racist books was more practical than memory. Having been born in Nigeria and spending much of my childhood in Jamaica during the early 1970s, Reading was defined by scarcity. We didn't have the luxury to discriminate between types of books and types of authors, certainly between white books and black books. The very idea that a book should relate to me was an unimaginable privilege. To be offended by it would only be a luxury. Whether Richard Kipling, Daniel Defoe, or Mark Twain, or colonial pulp icons, H. Ryder Haggard, or James Hadley Chase, a book was a book was a book, the raw fact of which vindicated its content, its content. Of course, I didn't know these books were racist, or would one may become so branded. And I was never judged by the type of books they were. For example, my obsession with girls' books like the Nancy Drew series or Judy Blue drew no questions of my incipient blasphemy. Yet I wasn't lying to how Haggard depicted Africans, or Wild West author Zane Gray described natives, or how Edgar Rice Burroughs crafted his aliens. The comparative of racially identifying with authors or characters just hadn't entered my critical repertoire. That was something to discover in America, where even in the harshest environments, it was overwhelming. It was also where I would discover that despite their wide availability, Books now came with limits as to how we should be read. Because we fled two countries before I was old enough and able to read, my reality had always been comprised of aliens and strangers. 
Reading was a practice of engaging different worlds and peoples, many wondrous, many hostile. Yet even when characters who looked like me were treated reprehensibly, if acknowledged at all, reading made evident unpredictable ways that differences could connect, sometimes against the author's will. For example, not seeing myself in any of the characters enabled me to identify with all of them, so in a sense, it's impossible. And suspecting that the author might have been hostile to someone like me only made the dance of interpretation more exciting. This all taught me to find freedom even in narratives held bent on my age. I was then armed with an arrogance that would serve me well in classrooms where I was the only black student or with white professors who refused me access to their offices or police officers who dared assume me not to. These books taught me how to navigate and survive in hospitable spaces. And though I didn't know this, as I migrated from a majority black country to one where I would be for the first time a racial minority, those books had prepared me for them. It was in fact racist books that led me to graduate study. Books that were purportedly anti-racist or focused on racial pride or social justice were too single-minded in their commitment to vindication or affirmation. I found them tedious, preaching. <coughs> They merely assumed my interests, and so they did not court my interests. The authors and characters may have looked like me, but I didn't recognize myself in them because the self I had discovered in literature was never reduced to the skin. This means that before deciding to study English, therefore destroying my immigrant family's dreams and hopes, I had already learned something that would serve me well in academia. That is, one could love a work of literature while reading that story. <clears throat> this seems so obvious, it's hard to believe, plus the other defend it. To teach students the opposite is to hobble them with the innocence. Given the current stress of purifying canons and racing signs of historical identity or racial pathology, I'm aware of what it means to be in a curious position of celebrating racism. Don't even get me started on music. To cleanse the past, though, is not only to rob ourselves of the prickly pleasures, unique challenges of such works. More importantly, it can aid in the removal of evidence from the sea of mind. I'm also aware that in a time of absolutes, a preference for ambiguity may reek of compromise, particularly for those seeking absolution from truly black professors. But despite that fear of being on the wrong side that is characteristic of our current moment and which cripples so many students, I've opted to make things more difficult. I teach the nuance to be suspicious of those too confident of being right side. It would be easy to argue that the hybrid Creole cultures of the Caribbean are what made me wary of today's commitments to purity or being an immigrant liberated me from the need for cultural wholeness, it was instead those goddamn racist books. They taught me to enjoy the frisson of contradiction, the jarring disparities between what people say of themselves and what they actually do. These contradictory affirmations are in fact what immigrants and minority writers and scholars have long met and may be our greatest contribution to culture. If anything, Critical race theories with their focus on how seemingly neutral dictates can mass historical violence and ongoing social contradictions only made me appreciate these books even more. But the books also taught me that we are all shaped and rendered impure by racism, colonialism, and various forms of inequality all the time and in all texts. Who or what we would be without those forces is on answer. Those who do try to answer those questions often attempt to excise those ugly forces from the school. They are not after the past. It's our future. I'll, I'll conclude by quoting one of my favorite racists, also shaped by migration and the Caribbean, Jean Reese. It's a surprisingly sentimental insight from a writer legendary for tragic battles against purity. Quote, Reading makes immigrants of us all. 
It takes us away from home, but more important, finds homes for us everywhere. To make sanctuary and to make sanctuary in a hostile or indifferent territory is a necessary step. It is, I think, essential to survival in a nation stratified by race, flush with strangers, or resting imperfectly on histories who may not enjoy but dare not find. Now that piece came out in 2021. I don't know if you recall 2021, but there was a lot going on around questions of the canon and memory and the archive. I would talk about certain texts. I began to have students come into my office saying, Professor, I want to study with you, but I will not read books by racists, or I will not read books by state. Some of you know what I'm talking about. It still continues, and it's a struggle we must all engage. But when they say, I'm not reading a book by racists, you know how many books that means you're not reading? <laughs> I mean, to say I'm not going to read the book by sex is not going to work. I'm making fun of it because now I'm hoping you can sort of look back on a couple of years ago and understand what's been going on. It's not ended, and I don't think it should end, but I think we should be engaged in kinds of things about how we to the steps. But I wrote that, that was the first thing I published after the memoir was published. And it was also, in a way, a response to the climate that the memoir had arrived in. There was a climate when publishers were all telling people and other people, you should change the title of your book to How to Not Be Racist. <laughs> <laughs> you should change your book to Free the Soul of White Oppression. <laughs> those, those books, y'all know what I'm talking about. Those are funny. And so people were being pressured by publishers to do that. So that's one of the reasons why, as I said, the title of that essay doesn't do me any better, but at the time it was me sort of doing a middle finger to the climate. So, but it was also me responding to some sections in the memoir about the reading. So, um, I'm going to read some sections that speak to this or that fit in form. So, I'm going to read just sections from a chapter called All the Young Dudes, which is about growing up in South Central Los Angeles. I don't have to explain the universe. The rumor was that the Bloods were planning to open fire on our school playground sometime today. That street gang controlled the area from downtown Inglewood all the way back to the Crenshaw district of South Los Angeles, just beyond where my mother and I are lived. When we'd arrived from Washington, D.C., I couldn't yet recognize the hand signs, icons, colors, and other dif differences between the gangs that were everywhere. The Bloods, the eight trade gangster Crips, or the Bloodstone Pyros, I just called them all Diamond Dogs in my head in homage to the David Bowie album of the same name. His vision of a post apocalyptic world of feral teenagers roaming the streets seemed just right. Learning to distinguish between gangs and territories was as crucial to my survival as dodging the police, who seemed unable to differ differentiate between gangbangers and any random cluster of black boys. Our junior high school was flanked by the concrete buildings of the Inglewood Courthouse to the north and another set of gray structures to the west. The school's location gave rise to many jokes about how convenient the site made it for students to ping pong from building to building, courthouse to prison. Those jokes weren't completely untrue because it wasn't unusual to see friends or brothers of friends on their way to court in recently purchased suits. Just behind the school was the Inglewood Public Library, also our incumbent. Behind the high library was the local high school, which had a reputation in line. Its location, the heart, Inglewood. The stories of gang violence and mayhem at times may have been exaggerated, but were eagerly embraced by us middle school boys because they enhanced our own street credibility. Which is why the rumors of snipers firing at our playground quickly became fact in our minds when the principal announced over the loudspeaker that we weren't allowed out of our classrooms during recess or lunch. All the boys clustered by the windows, eager to witness or claim participation in whatever was about to happen. I joined them, thrilled finally to be in a world of men. 
When it came time for gym class, we filed out from the locker rooms into the gymnasium. The exercise of the day, coach announced, was square dancing. <laughs> as strange as this was, we dared not complain because coach terrified us. She was white and a woman and was rumored to be able to dunk the best. More than a few of us mumbled that the spare dancing was a life. The coach ignored us. She was clearly looking for a way to keep us off the paper. The dance would force the boys and the girls to engage one another. We were at the age when being coerced into dancing allowed us to maintain that feigned indifference to one another that we were attempting to master. We grabbed our partners and do si do and laughed at the white people's music the coach played for the record player. I laughed louder than most because I couldn't let anyone know that country music was wildly popular in Jamaica in Nigeria and more, more familiar to me at the time than the music my American peers listened to. After class, coach led us through the school and outside the building as if we were having a fire drill. She set us free in front of the courthouse where there were always police guards and officers moving in, out, and around the great buildings that today seemed to protect rather than, rather than intimidate. My friends were waiting near the police cars with rumors about why what we'd expected did not happen. Some said the gang chose a different school. Some said they got caught with dates. No one our age walked these streets alone. Even if we quarreled or fought, it was always understood that the walks to and from school were never forfeited. Whether we chose to go straight down La Brea or to cut through Sentinel Park, it was always best to be in a group. No one wanted to be alone in case of a run in with diamond dogs or any wannabes looking to make a name for themselves or the police whose intentions were always opaque or other groups of boys or girls as afraid as we were and equally eager. Just as my friends and I were about to cross Prairie Avenue to the park, I realized I left something behind in the locker room. Something no, so, no different to me than an internal organ and just as one. In a panic, hoping I was wrong, I rummaged through my bag. My friends wondered what was going on. Was it money, my house, homework, some girl's phone number? Terrified and not daring to tell what I'd lost, and bolted back towards the school. That I would do so alone was to convey to the others how serious this was. When I got back to the school, the police cars were gone, the doors closed, and the gates chained. One of the school counselors escorted me in once he saw the urgency on my face, and after I told him that I had left something important in the locker room, my stomach went queasy and my eyes closed. I was so scared that it didn't matter. The terror came from imagining one of the older boys, or one of my friends, or one of those boys who constantly had beat with me for one reason or another in possession of what I lost. What I did find was the empty folder that had held what would make me more vulnerable in this community than my accent, my familiarity with country and western music, or my adoration of David Bowie. It was what had been my first attempt. When I first started walking to school with the boys in my neighborhood, I refused to carry a backpack or a gym bag because I wanted my books to be seen. But this public display was to me a signifier of arrival. It may have led to me being singled out by gangbangers for beatings, but that didn't trouble me much. In the wake of this of the relentless mockery of my friends, though, I took notice. All of this reading meant, apparently, that I was, according to some of them, acting in right. Bowie's music and also the reggae and calypso my family played a little too loudly on weekends drew the same accusation. Anything that was alien to my friends and neighbors was branded white, even if it came from Jamaica or Nigeria. This accusation was already a strong cliche, a strong cliche in this suburb of Black America, even among those who rejected it as a racist name. It didn't seem a reasonable insult to me because there were barely any white people to me. There's no white people to act white. <laughs> and why would I want to imitate white people? Even the white people on TV didn't read books. 
I remember no more than four white kids in a school of hundreds of black. A few white families still in our neighborhood never interacted with their neighbors, and their children were never seen on the street. Those kids appeared only in classes where they were judged as weak to be pitied, not rich. <laughs> they may have been ensconced in advanced or mentally gifted groups, but we all knew it was because they were unable to survive. White kids rarely appeared on the playground, and the girls wore their hair in rigid buns for fear that some other student would like to get on fire. The only other whites were teachers, head coaches, librarians, police officers, none of whom lived in the neighborhood. Acting white, then, had nothing to do with white people. Learning this was a true revelation. Acting white had to do with how those who read spoke and how they began to react to the people in the world around them. It defined the curiosity seen as dangerous because it meant we were testing this community's definition. Limits. This curiosity had to police, had to be policed, it seemed to me, because it threatened those definitions of limits by suggesting they could be transformed. What seemed especially strange, given what I knew from being born on the African continent and having spent years on a majority black island, was that blackness had nothing to do with where we came from, at least not in this neighborhood. We immigrants certainly weren't black. We were told so regularly by our neighbors to friends who were apparently really black. If whiteness wasn't really about skin, then neither was blackness. Stop happening, stop happening, stop happening. <laughs> I was silent on the walk to school after a weekend spent mostly indoors. It never occurred to any of the boys I walked with to imagine that the plan to shoot up our schoolyard the week before had been a rumor or hoax or empty threats. At school, the day continued as it usually did. There was no sign that anyone had found or read my manuscript, but that only intensified my paranoia. The silence could have been produced by a vast conspiracy that everybody was in. A message came to the playground, either at lunch or recess, that coach wanted to see me. I thought nothing of it beyond the likelihood that something I'd done wrong had finally caught up with me. I met her in her office near the chair. I sat slumped, resigned to hear how I was going to be punished for whatever I'd done. I didn't notice my manuscript fanned out on the desk between us like a deck of Is this yours? Her voice was stern as usual. The voice of a woman with a dumb voice. Shocked, I reluctantly said yes. Then she asked me again with more than a hint of disbelief. She leaned back in the chair and shook her head from side to side. You wrote that? She said incredulous. All of that yourself? Yes, I told her. It's fine. But why did you write it? Her voice became low. It never occurred to me to ask myself why I wrote. Writing was simply an outgrowth of reading. I answered in a gesture typical of teenagers, a quasi universal response to ineffable. <laughs> I wondered if she'd keep my manuscript or throw it away. If she chose to do the matter, I hoped she'd be kind enough to make sure it was not. Okay, she said. I gathered up the pages quickly. Before I closed the door behind me, she called my name. I said the strangest thing, the whitest thing. I ran to my locker to make sure I hid the manuscript before bumping into anyone curious about what I held so closely to my chest was strong enough to take it. I stood that here. Coach said more of those strange, warm, white folk. Hello. <laughs> Have a nice day. <laughs> she never said if she read or liked the manuscript or asked any specific questions. The fact that I've written it seemed enough to earn her ongoing attentiveness. One day, she approached me in the middle of the table. Angrily, loudly, she demanded I march off to her. 
fact that she continued to treat me like a thug in public was surprisingly jealous. Her demeanor changed in the privacy of her office. Sitting me down, she presented me with a large box from the floor next to the desk. I opened it to find it packed with old and worn science fiction novels, including the shiny textured covers that in Jamaica were rare. It was hard to maintain my chosen persona when I saw that this collection had been curated by someone who knew and loved these books as I did. There were books I hadn't read by Marion Zimmer Pratt, Robert E. Howard, Philip Jose Farmer, but others by Michael Warcock, Andre Norton, and Larry Niven were actually new to me. There was even an almost complete collection of Edgar Rice Brothers and Arthur Stevens. You know I'm nerding out, but one or two people in the room probably know this name. So. I thought Coach was merely showing the books to me. She sent the box to smile. The collective, after all, the students have been seen. So no one had seen it. But it crippled with a gratitude, did not know how to express. For the books. Coach's acknowledgement of the difference between persona and self lifted a burden. Her actions suggested that the space between the two would be a terrain of struggle for some time, but that it was a battle that could be waged in secret and that could be won. From the okay, well, let me just run through some of the section. I had a conversation with some folks last night that uh, suggested that we would read this section. This is me interviewing my mother about. Wow. Experiences in Africa. For those of you who don't know the work that one is Jamaican, she married a person who turned out to be involved in the office. For that, she was in London, part of what's called the Regional Exchange. I want to hear about 1963 when you arrived in Nigeria. Am I going over this? I want to hear about 1963 when you arrived. That was when the country was still brimming, as you used to say. Three years after independence, right? Four years before the Civil War. But you should tell me how you met it. I told you this before. You should record it. Where is that small, small issue? Talking about archive. It's just not the same as writing down what you've said. I don't like writing what I hear back on. That makes sense. It clearly did, but she looked down the way, looking for the cat. By the way, my mother is supposed to I've come to interpret this gesture as a polite way of indicating Then she'd wrinkle her brow as if trying to recall something important. Honestly. I was working in Bristol. He was training all over the place. It was very real. He and the other officers, like the Godfather, were very, very serious. There are pictures here of them running and jumping during the exercises. But they also traveled with boxes and boxes of a kind of what we now will call an archive expert. We just called it. It was a term. Back row. Back row. That's the ungenerous term. But after a while, you realize that pack rat is also it's our guy. <laughs> It's a domestic personal private archive. Um, and so I grew up with them all over the place. So as before she passed away, I was going to ask her, what's this one? What's this one? She also wrote on the back of them and took notes. Who must have found them? For God's sake, all those African officers were getting their countries. That was the excitement. But he never seemed tired. When your father showed up to see me, the little boy in the house told his parents that an African soldier was at the door. So again, how did you know? It was like Dr. Shabbat. Lovely film, that was amazing. And she began singing a song that I eventually discovered a song somewhere in my love, loud singing. 
the types of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> what I remember about that film was the love story and the revolution and trains. I was on a train when we first saw each other, you know? I don't remember if I was going from London to Bristol, or from Bristol to London, or somewhere else. I was with a friend. We were walking to our seats, and there in front of me were these long legs stretched out across the aisle. I said, excuse me, please. And the rest of his body appeared in uniform. He and his friend was talking their language, and they acted like it was their fault. Nobody in West Indian could have acted that way. I thought maybe he didn't speak English. But then he did the most extraordinary thing. He stood up, made his friends stand up too, both bowed. The one that was in English. What did he say? What did you say? Well, I still thought he didn't speak English. He just stared at us, and I said, Thank you. He walked by. That's really all. He didn't look back, or he didn't try to get your attention. Girls like that do not look back. <laughs> and to West Indian people, that was just John Pay. Africans? <laughs> I knew some people moved with them in London, but those were islanders of the North Times. <laughs> people we would have called Bush. I know there was some hostility to the marriage from the Chinese side. From my English speaking friends, too, for different reasons, they thought it wouldn't be safe to go where people live in trees and such foolishness. But my English friends relaxed when they saw him in his uniform. I heard his English and found out about Sanders. Father and his peers went to Sanders for the town. It's the West Point of the world. Actually, kind of above the West Point. It's where the nobles go from the territory. There was some glamour there, like some of the Africans who were going to Oxford and Cambridge, or the ones we saw in Teddy after Ghana was independent. You know, dark glasses. Speak English very properly. Ghana's independence was 1957. We thought of it as the first black one. And so in London, it's a great thing. She began to sing a calypso. That's what I was telling you about last night. I recognize it as the legendary calypsonia North Kitchener's birth of Ghana. Smiling, eyes closed, swaying as much as she could, she continued. I think that might be when we really began to understand. All the race riots and things were going on in London, and then suddenly it was all about Ghana, and then about Nigeria. Guinea, <laughs> the black man was on the rise. After this and that, other such things. But I tried not to get, a call, get all caught up in that at first. I was there for a reason. Sounds like quite a time to be in England. Well, I was in Bristol, which was not a quiet place, mind you, but it did seem that black people in England were all of us. There was Cuba, too and Kenya, and Egypt, independence everywhere, and all over the place. At first, I didn't pay much attention because I was working, and studying, and sending money back. I made it to staff nurse, and then I was a midwife. Suddenly, white people had black nurses who were delivering white babies and tending to the dying. People were not happy, and there's no anger like the anger that comes when people have no choice in that. But we were professionals. We're supposed to be cultural ambassadors. I still think we were, even though your generation is there. I didn't know any Africans at all. It was only after I met him that I realized how close I'd been to them the whole time. I mean, they had been there all along. Not knowing them couldn't have been an accident. He just shows up at your door in Bristol. Pat, my her friend, and I had on our nurses' uniform, so that was it, you know, on the train. He asked around. He was famous for his child. A prince among men, they said. Really, they all said. I just think it's easy to be charming when you're just all. <laughs> ha! He just knocked on the door in his uniform, standing tall, and the young boy of the house, a real rascal, far too curious for his own good, used to follow me around with the strangest questions. He didn't ask to see my tail when I first arrived because so many English people thought we had tails. He came running back to the part of where I was and said, there was an African at the door. What an African soldier he is. And then six weeks later, you're married and you're in Nigeria? <laughs> well, we were legally married in England, or else it wouldn't have been right for the world. And then we had a grand state ceremony in Vegas. What, six weeks? Of the photos he kept of my father, only two were in 
out his room. In one he wore a dashi, which softened his features and expressions. His skin was pale as if washed out by the light of the long time. There had never been any talk of European leaving the early Fulan brother or family. And in the other picture of him out of uniform, the only one of him in his family, his father and mother was dark as all of you. There was also a wedding announcement in his diary in Jamaica. I didn't say that, did I? My goodness. My parents, I suppose they could resist since I was getting married to an African prince. That was cool. It was the only way to make them feel it was okay to say he was a prince or a king. Which wasn't true, but not a lie. <laughs> Plus, I'm sure him having light skin made a positive impact on the journey. The pictures I sent them were of raised swords, uniforms, big cars. They had to have been proud. It was like proper English royalty, but African. And that worked, do you think? For some. But the letters from home never stopped asking if he had other wives, or about wild animals, or did he actually live in trees? But when the war started, they were just trying to find us. When we returned to Jamaica, they were just so happy to see me and my baby, the son of an African king. She smiled. I remember my princely treatment in Jamaica. She said, But you always exaggerate your suffering out of the past. It's great. Those people were good to you. They said, But maybe you try to diminish and get the suffering. That's very English. She looked away, this time so emphatically, that when the cat returned, Seem to do so to save us from happiness. It's talking about so you were in Lagos at the beginning of the war. You were in Lagos when people started moving east to Igbo land, to Biafra. No, I was between Enugu, where you were born, and Onisha, who was stationed. You were born at the start of the bombing. We traveled to Onisha, where I was training nurses. We drive to Lagos for parties and visits. And when you went to the Congo with your godfather, that was for a United States, a United Nations mission after Patrice Lumumba was killed. While he was gone, they stayed in the village. You mentioned his traveling. He went to India too, right? Yes, for a military training course. It was 1966. There was a coup that year that people say in the Civil War. She became withdrawn. I wondered if it was the medication, the remembering, or both. The 1966 coup was a particularly bloody one, led by a cadre of soldiers who killed almost two dozen high ranking political and social figures, including Nigerian Prime Minister Abu Bakr, Tafawa, Balewa, and the Muslim leader of the North, Sir Amadou Bello, and the Sarduna of Sokoto. This coup, led largely by Igbo leaders, was viciously subdued by the government, but it triggered a counter coup six months later by Muslim officers in northern Nigeria. Although the Igbo soldiers who had led the prior coup argued that its focus was on anti corruption, Muslim officers saw it as based on their history. The counter coup caused a suspension of the Nigerian constitution. Military government was installed with Lieutenant Colonel Yakuba Gawan, like father and godfather's colleague from the Sandy Coast. This installation justified in the minds of many Northerners long standing suspicion that the Igbos were trying to take over the country. The cultural impact of Igbos, who were the first to embrace Christian, the English language, and Western education, and their having a culture devoted to enterprise is why many describe them as the Jews of Africa. Their being targeted for genocide would seal that description. There's something that seems to obsess the historians. It doesn't make that sense to me. A lot of people say my father was part of the 1966 group. And he was their man in the East. 
history books still say that. Why was he mysteriously sent to India just before it happened? He worked on a training course, yes. He brought me that wooden bed. I'll show you. You read it, I played with it. You were young, but I kept it for you. You would have lost it. You know what it is? But was he a part of that proof, that proof that something actually started the war? It seems to me that if you were going to lead a military strike, he'd not suddenly leave right before the war. Look, you And if he was involved, wouldn't he be arrested when he got back? I will be truly distraught if that egg is not in this house. Okay, then. Let's talk about the village. Sometimes you stay here alone. Boy, you know that you never did it. She laughed. I used to say that all the time. But you were there alone after you died. What else would I do? You came back to the village and stayed there until we left the country weeks before the Yafa fell. I want to talk about that. But first, I want to know what the village was like in the early days of you. Well, at first, I did miss Lagos. But you know, the point was to become a broken man. Even though your father always told you to be a Jamaican woman, God bless you, he and your godfather wanted the women in the village to be like me. Can you imagine? They imitate me while I'm imitating them? Your godfather said I was the modern black woman, which I don't think that you think he was very serious about the Afro being a struggle, a symbol of the struggle of the black man, which I didn't understand. I didn't you understand? Well, when we said it in England, we were talking about whites or racism or the color bar and all of that. Here, the northerners and the federal government were also the black man. So what he said made no sense unless black was his way of saying something else, in which case he should have found it. Apparently, she accepted the logic of the black man up to a certain point. It was a thing that men said. Such thinking became unacceptable to her when the federal government's blockade of the Afra started to produce people results. Britain was still her mother country, despite the racism she didn't help it. But it was aware of their starvation. But, but Britain was aware of the starvation and violence in the Afra and discouraged other nations from intervening. With the numbers of people dying all around her as Biafra was brought to heal, it was clear that there was no more hope placed in the mother country or the black man. Or maybe he meant that all Nigerians were struggling against the legacy of the British and colonialists. They were involved in this too. Ah, British just wanted oil. They supported genocide to protect the poor. The worst thing to happen to Nigeria is they found oil in the East before independence. Our mistake was to think that it would be without consequence. That's still the main problem? The oil? No, it's not the oil that's the main problem. Well, the British wanted it, I said. I'm sure the Americans wanted it too. That's what I mean. That's not much. Not even much. What do I mean? You want to blame whites. You want to blame America. Go ahead. This time I was the one who moved away. She was sitting up now without the cushion. Her cat was in her arms, and she stroked it with great concentration. As revenge, I imagined her as the type of comic book villain James Bond used to face, who had cats to signify <laughs> sinister. <laughs> when she talked about Biafra, she usually emphasized the oil and the fact that the British had supported the federal government against the Afra due to it. This sudden refusal to see the war as colonial and racial was as much a comment on my godfather's faith in the black man as it was a critique of my own racialized politics, which to her must have seen, seen similar. It was understandable, diff understandably difficult to challenge her on these topics. She had seen men and boys in fragments, bones exposed and limbs held together. Houseboys and gardeners, teachers and merchants, priests and taxi drivers, friends and enemies, dying in ways that suggested depths of hatred that could not be explained by oil or borders or skin or arbitrary names. And yeah. Then there was Ashapur, which haunted her for the rest of her She watched the bellies of children swell, heads balloon. 
Their bones fragile like long bits of cord found in the In her view, it was indecent to assign blame for the violence itself. Nobody was behind all this. So those who did the dirty, those who did not, those who did not, those who did everything. I think I should start. Okay. 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 Um, so we're going to open up for questions. We had a, a couple of classes. For instance, my class uh, asked you to go to the next one. Do you want to go? Wait, you can go to the next one. I'll ask that for a second. So can I can I open the door? Hello, hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for our last week. And my question was about how you wrote about your mother in the novel. So first, um, for, I like how you contextualize contextualize the importance of your mother and kind of the role she played throughout the stages of her life. So I kind of just wanted to ask you about the concept of your writing about her and maybe how it evolved throughout the memoir and some of your kind of your reflection and progress on the role that she played and what you wanted readers to take away from the conversation. Thank you. Um I feel very one of the signs I think that I've done, I think, a pretty good job of representing her voice and her presence is the fact that a number of people have said to me that it should have been about your mother. <laughs> people have actually said that, that we want more about your mother. But part of what I did in the book is that you know you can't tell everybody's story. My father's story is also an important part of what I do. This book was initially when she did this massive thing, in the trilogy, because there's so much information. But then the process by which you I've seen a couple of times, you know, as a scholar, you want to tell everything, but as an artist, you really can't. You want to. And so I was like, I want to be able to sort of represent the mother, but have you want to know more? Understand that her impact was kind of at times not present, but very present all the time. So the process for me was, of course, more about tech. She talked about things, many things she didn't want to talk about. But when I became a scholar and then a writer, I would push and prop. Sometimes it was hard, and sometimes it was easy. I think I mentioned that towards the end of her life, she got me into gin and tonic. And it helped. <laughs> right? It made her more voluble. She had more things to say. Because a lot of things she just genuinely did not want to talk about. Genocide. So, what you have in this book. Basically, the crystallizing of years of conversation. But I didn't bring all that into the conversation. It's not the book. I just got the stuff that really spoke to the important things. And I really hope that as a reader, I hope you can do this. You see the impact, you know that there's tension. Because much of the stories that you've grown up, you said for a book, I don't have to read them. I've heard also not telling the things I'm So, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, but uh, my mother is the, even though my father is the recognized political, my father and my godfather are more important political voices around this book. People come to this book, certainly coming from Nigeria, are coming to know about the Afra, right? But it's not really a story about her. It's about a Caribbean woman who gets caught up in it accidentally. <laughs> and through that accident has this child, and I want that to be the core of the book because that allows me to kind of uh, speak to but also critique some of the politics of the African, Pan African politics, etc. So I hope that I convey that her, her centrality is also due to politics at times. But again, when people say to me, even people who are harsh about the book, I say, yeah, but I love you. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, well, that's a compliment. And that was a very difficult thing to, to, to establish that. But the best way I, it turns out to do it is to leave stuff out. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.
see that a lot of the conversations imply previous ones that aren't there. That's deliberate strategy. I'm curious about um and when you were reading the fifth and talking about your your conversations with your mom and her her constant practices of refusal uh -huh. um, yeah. and the ways that she would shift she would shift the conversation or which I wanted to be put in the mix. Yeah. yeah. Um I, I'm curious about the choice, the desire to do that when it seemed like she was so hesitant to to, to be in the story. Right. And so kind of a question of how do we how did you think about sort of the care required to sort of sit with this archive that is your mother's um, when she perhaps how do you reconcile her refusal mm -hmm. with the need to include her in the story? Well, as long as we keep in mind, her refusal wasn't really a refusal to be in the story. Mm -hmm. right? Because she had kept all this material her whole life. I think I say somewhere mm -hmm. in the book that this is, this what is this? Something to the effect of yeah, this, this refugee had more baggage than anyone. <laughs> this is the most baggage, I don't know, I don't know how to say it, but this is a refugee who had lots of she traveled all over the world with like a lot of stuff. Ended up with no home multiple times, but still with chunks of stuff all over the place. She, she wrote a lot of notes, right? Some of the things that are framed in conversation, back to her question as well, were things that she actually wrote, right? Like stuff about the thing about the tale. She would tell me about that, but I'd read it. She wrote it down, you know, back in the 1950s and 60s. I found those back. So she wanted the story told. And I talked to her over the years as I began writing the story. She was like, okay, we need to tell the story. We need to tell our story. So she gave me language, she gave me materials. So the refusal isn't about her not wanting to be a part of the story. It's also really about her and I having deep theological struggles around race, immigration, diaspora, generation, which I wanted to be part of the story too. So it's her wanting to talk on her terms when she wants. It does. I, I'm thinking a lot about it seems like she's not interested in even though she exists and is part of different cultures of oral storytelling, she doesn't want to be a, 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 like in the ways that she writes. Um she's just like, I don't know, I'm thinking through the question still, but um there is a, a a distancing from the orality that the story renders anyway. But um that's a good that's a good um, insight because as I said, she wrote them. So I mean, there's a time when I think I think she at some point thought she would tell this story, but when she left the office, a lot of people left the office. Nobody, millions of people were right? and people, and this is not just now, people who come out of these experiences are pretty convinced nobody's going to remember and no one's going to talk about. It. And that's why she gathered so much stuff. So she thought that she would be able to tell the story, but once she had a son, he could write and do the work, she passed it all off. And so that's probably why the oral thing might be a little bit limited for her. She wanted to, to write yeah. the story. And another thing, though, I make fun of this in the book. For me, it's the way to make fun of it. She was very proud of it. She was British. <laughs> <laughs> And being a writer and a formal narrative, she comes from that. She comes from a generation of Jamaican middle class people who were British. That's how they saw themselves. And so, if you read the writing that she did, it's all very formal <laughs> and very stereotypical British. I think in her ideal world, the story would be told because she gathered all these pictures and would tell the story herself. That day. Thank you. Yeah. It was, uh, what? It's funny, just um, a few weeks ago, I pared stuff down yet again. Right? Because, um, there, well, there are things in there that aren't really, you know, her archive was very valuable, important historical material, right? But also, it was genuine stuff that she could keep and had nothing to do with the apparatus. You know, grocery lists. You know, I know that counts as archival. I know, right? But her grocery list, grocery lists, of Costco or Safeway from the nineteen eighties could be of value to some other kind of archival imagination. But some of those things I've pared down, and I just 
But this is about having a choice for me. I focused on the things that I thought were really important. Political and historical value from my perspective. Also, my wife, she also said, no, 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 that. that's important too. Yeah. So there's a constant struggle again because you can't travel around with all this stuff. This is a lot of stuff. So I'm just trying to hone it down. I'm not sure what's going to happen to it, but I continue to cure it. Because after she passed away, she was an archivist. But she was also a <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that you had to get rid of, especially as you can the life you can't help. I made some choices, and it's a painful thing. The moment of life. But this driver's license application in 1969. Do I keep that? You know, maybe one day I'll discover that it was of great value to some other part of the story. <clears throat> I made some hard choices sitting in the space. It's still a painful thing to think about stuff that I'm buying. Yes. Hey, um, I love your book. I love your book. Uh, my question is about the tension between the two guys. I can share it, so I found it very difficult. And I wanted to ask, uh, like, when I Words that are another uh, basic point. Kind of my thing, kind of neutralize it in some way. Because when you think the house of birth, and then I'm just going to put it in a paper box, like put the box in the shelf. Instead uh, of allowing that person to read it through the door. Yeah. And I wonder in what your experience is and how you handle it in the future. Um. Techniques. Well, I like the way you frame it since we're talking about box on the shelf. That's perfect. <laughs> um, by resisting if you put it on the shelf in that way, or just introduce it to a box. Now, I think we can go too far by making it so radiant that it includes everything else. So, I think the technological strategies that matter are the ones that are to balance pervasive significance. As well as in different ways that not only the characters negotiate, navigate, perpetuate, resist, you know, but also how you use an instructor and students. That's what you're learning how people negotiate, navigate, perpetuate, resist. And so I just think it's important to keep it being present as this is the thing that can be. But I think you have to be aware of where we are now. We're in a moment right now where there's a great desire to sort of share over. And so I can't give you any specific tip because I don't really have to teach you on the podcast and speakers. But it's a really important thing to just not talk. So I'm first to sort of be able to engage with the stuff for the pleasure of the state. Also, Murph, some of these great people from that period, you have to be able to critique them. You bring them comfortably on deep balance, but also you Text I um I was wondering about uh what the process of writing the memoir itself was like in terms of the balance between the artistic process and the therapeutic process. And then my sub question is if you think there was like an interesting emotional toll on your mother in living in such close proximity to an archive. Well, then you do have to remind me of all the other points that you mentioned. But I'll start with the end. The emotional, that's the pathway stuff, right? And I know there are people who find that term increasingly offensive, I know. Because it represents a psychic story. It's a real difficulty for people to get rid of things. But as I say in the book, that began with her not wanting to get rid of this material. It's very important historical and political and cultural material. But then that just turned into a kind of habit of keep not wanting to get rid of anything else. Right? So that was the emotional toll. And she knew that it was, she, knew, she didn't like that about herself. She didn't like the fact that she, at a certain point, could not distinguish between the archives of 
beheadings. So a bunch of folks with beheadings from the yeah, right? And old toothbrushes that she kept. You know? And her argument was always, we are so privileged in America, we don't realize that these old toothbrushes can save people's lives. Right? And so she always like, don't get rid of things. We're in America, we have to hold on to them so we can ship them back. And I discovered that she would ship stuff back all the time, but then a point came when she couldn't, then it just started to stay in the house. And that was the evolution of the Does that answer the last one? What was the important thing? Oh, um, it was about the balance between like the artistic process of writing the memoir and the therapeutic process. Okay, the therapeutic, because I was the, the scholarly slash artistic is. As a scholar, you're of course trying to tell the whole story and be honest with all of your perspectives. However, as a scholar in our moment, we kind of expect it to be more ideologically focused. So we took a tell you a specific value. For me, I brought in lots of people from my family who don't even need to be <laughs> never have. And that was helpful because I want to remind people that there is no univocality in the past. Kind of thing that I do in all of my work. But in the family, I was able to get all these people thinking, maybe, this is the world as it is, but bring it back to Asper. Both are just much more open in my experience of thinking. But as an artist, you don't want to tell the whole story, you want to imply gesture towards it, but you don't want to tell the whole thing. That's bad for <laughs> Therapeutic is interesting because I've lived with the story my whole life and I've wanted to tell it in multiple ways for many people. I tried writing this as a novel many years ago, a couple of times. I tried thinking, well, then maybe it should be this kind of tone, this kind of thing. Um, all of that was me trying to find the most appropriate way to tell the story. And finally, when I got an opportunity from the agent, publishers, and all that, I began to work with people who were able to sort of help me decide which voice was stronger than the other. And so, though that was therapeutic, the book, After the Brain and the Voice, came out fairly easy. It came out fairly easy. Um, the hard part was cutting stuff out, deciding what to not include. First couple of drafts were. Um, that wasn't so therapeutic. But what was therapeutic was what happened after this marriage. Because you're so busy trying to create a work that part of the responsibility to history, politics, and scholarship, but also a work that's something creative and beautiful, right? We don't focus so much on the therapeutic. The therapeutic came when people started reading it and asking the question. I think I told Chris and Fraser after I finished this book. I haven't talked about it publicly in the last three years. Because once it got published, I asked questions. That's when I realized she told me that she would take to do events like this to start personally to take this. I have been on Zoom calls with people, 100 people on Zoom or whatever, tons of people, and you can't talk because. When you lose the truth, you learn to live with your loss. But when you have to talk about it all the time, you can live with your loss. So that's when the therapeutic stuff sort of kicked in. So this is therapeutic right now because only in the last couple of weeks, last week or so, I started talking about the book again. And now I feel like I'm part of a different stage of the therapeutic. But when I was writing it, I was more focused on trying to balance being an artist and a scholar. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for the rest of it. Yeah, yeah, I'm Um, but uh, uh, I mean, this in the most sincere way, and some from uh, my own questions about how did you decide that you had. The right to write in your <laughs> um, and I partially I ask that because you're exceptional in so many ways, and there is um, 
uh, a way in which the memoir is somehow representative of something that uh, an audience is going to recognize itself. Um, whereas the story that you can tell amalgamates all of the you know, musical, lyrical elements of the um, infinite quality of all of these, but it's the story of a mixed race small section of the um, and part of where the 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 specificity of the um, collection resides is the advice to uh, she navigated her position and maybe something that owns a, a scholar of black various generations are people but um could you talk about that? I like I like yeah. well, the thing is I said earlier that I tried writing novels or yeah. trying to put it into novels simply because I didn't think that I had the right to it. I mean yes for that. Well but I just never felt that a memoir was something that should be perhaps after I wrote those novels, I realized, yeah, you shouldn't be that way. You didn't want to eat that right off, don't you? <laughs> Trust me, I wrote a couple of them. <laughs> so I never actually wanted to write them. But what made me write them was, I think, first and foremost, my mom, knowing that my mom wanted to say And so that's why I initially thought, well, then it'll be a book about the author, which would make more sense, right? <laughs> Talk about the Afrin relationship to black scholars. Pretty good. That would have been the best way <laughs> But the beauty and terror of my conversation with my mother needs to be her, right? her experience and mine, and the other people's experiences, the family, my uncles, etc. All of that mattered because it was the other part of the question. Not just that she wanted the story told, and it had to be the personal voice like that, and please try to approximate her in there. Because if I wrote a book on the opera and I asked, it would just be more scholarly and not just work. You wouldn't hear my mother. I want you guys to hear my mother. You don't hear my father. He mentions the name of the Not out of any disrespect, because he's the historic prominence, but I wanted to hear my mother's voice. But I also wanted to hear my uncle Irving's voice. I wanted to hear some of these people's voices. Because the other part of my fantasy is that they all die. They all die. So, die. Those deaths not immediately after each other, but it was like Each time someone died, it was at a weird and important stage by the So, my mother saw the proofs of my first book while she was plugged into the sheet. So, when I think of my first book and the difficulties that I had in it, it's because I didn't want to hear it. Sound of Culture, when I was working on my second story book, Ojuku died. God fuck died. Right? So, so many of these things sort of made me think their voices I have to tell the stories. I have to shape the stories in some way that speaks to the work that I've done with these diaries. The diaries is a The memoir is an honest way to not just articulate the story of the rest of that set of diaries. But also get those voices there. I mean, it's not putting my mom there, it's not my uncle, it's not these people, but it's a trace of it. I know a lot of people in the family die of something. I don't know how much time I have. This is an opportunity. So I really never planned to write. I also thought memoirs are for people who are much older. And then I realized that, oh shit, I am much older. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, 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 i am Divination, the way that they sort of put all of their emotes onto you, fairly or unfairly. Um, and you mentioned like growing up and not knowing that history and then having it 
presented to you in smaller bits yeah. as you grew up. And then once you feel engaged, like that comes in, like passionate people. Like that seemed like a very overwhelming experience. And so how did you kind of grapple with that and, and feeling like, you know, what you want to dedicate your life towards given all of these people you know, that I said briefly in the memoir somewhere that the moment I realized just how much they believed in me, so much of my life is living in the fact that I don't know. Other version of this book about being disappointed for many reasons, not only in terms of persons of your son and expectations of the future and this and the other, but also this is something any human can tell you. You know, there's expectations of you. Send money, and you have to do this, and you have to do that. And like I say in the memoir, for them, complaining about racism was about those with wings to fly complaining about the thing they're above. <laughs> and so, but then you have to struggle with that because racism and these issues are worth struggling for in their, their relations. So, how do you translate that to even bring that back to home is a disappointment. But to come back not super wealthy and sort of answer all questions financially. So the book and the tone of the book towards the end, which some people have not been expecting a more triumphant narrative, that tone is an acknowledgement that disappointment is something I live with. No matter what you do, I do help people spend money to do all these things, but that level of expectation, you just gotta get used to it from day one. You will fail there. So how do you live with them as a failure? That's what I told you. Um, you recently asked me your mom kind of like why I'm like you kind of angry with the fact that I think she didn't explain to you that as well as like the you know the main up that would give that to you. And I was wondering, you know, on the other way, yeah, I guess. <laughs> and like how um, you were kind of um, comparing it to the fact that you know she was a man and yeah. all you know, she would have given you that information. I was wondering if like Garvin was very young. So I hope people and people can tend to see that it's kind of not sarcastic but ironic to what both say find her in the world of men. The <laughs> right? Right. Or, or yeah, woman a, a man would have known how to deal with them. Not true. Right? So much of the book is a young person discovering the so-called privileges and pleasures of um, patriarchy. But of course, he's doing so when he's people taking care of all uh, people take protecting you are all women. We're surrounded by women. But in a patriarchal world, something will be wrong with that. And so you're always looking for the man for some sort of escape from all of these women surrounding you. Right? So you think there's something wrong. Oh well men would have known how to do it. Or when would men would have done something better? But it's a story about a young boy learning about boyness and manhood in a country that's structured approaching that way. If it were set in Nigeria and Jamaica, you know, patriarchs would have been different. It wouldn't have been strange surrounded by women, but it would have been odd in the way they were in that neighborhood. So I do want to stress that that's meant for you to look at this boy and <laughs> Because he does. There are some benefits now. I'm not able to determine what it would have been otherwise. You know what I mean? It's a lot of speculation, right? I would say there's certainly benefits and drawbacks. Because I also have problems with role model theory, right? That somehow role models determine you in certain ways. That's a longer conversation. I'm not sure about where I stand. But I would say, yes, there is a difference. What that difference is, I don't know that I would say. There are people who perform more ideological work and say, well, yes, it would have made you more this way and that way. But that gets to some stereotypes out of people. <laughs> a woman would have made you this way, and that would have made you this way. I'm hoping that these kids 
misunderstanding of gender codes and cues and its relationship to this. I want that to be not that the kid knows it, can face it. Is it okay if I ask one more question? Um, it's about, I'm, I'm very, I would love to ask about, so you talk about your mom having all these boxes, which later became, it, like they weren't considered archives until you started considering them as archive. Um, and I'm thinking about all the homes where these boxes live and all the stories that those boxes could also tell. Um, and I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about in the aftermath of writing this book and in the conversations that you've had with people who have encountered your book, um, any conversations you've had about them engaging with their own archive um, that they conceptualize as trash or pack ratty or whatever, and now perhaps might enter it different. Well, yes. Um, it's funny. A lot of these Nigerian or African historians from the continent, they were American, so American folks. Still don't think of the Afro. Sure. But Nigerian scholars and historians from West Africa have contacted me and my, my mom for years wanting access to this. Like the thing about India, when he went to India, I didn't get into that detail, but there's one crucial detail that historians want to know about. Yeah. Was my father one of the plotters of it? Because as I say, and I wrote today, right before the coup, he got sent to India, right? Which made no sense to me. And people think, did he get scared and go to India? But why would the government send him to India if he was the leader of that whole section of Nigeria? You know, I mean, how did he just go to India the night before a coup? So people are called, and I'm not, when I was young, I just thought it was annoying. My mother was just, didn't, she didn't want people to know. That's another thing about this memoir. There are a lot of things in there that I don't want you to know. But I want you to know that I don't want you to die. <laughs> because there are a lot of things that my mother didn't want to know. Or my father, like the section, another thing that people talk a lot about talk, is, dude, you have a sister? How do you know what I'm talking about? The section of right? which I don't actually address because in the book, I just basically, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. But I want you to know that I don't want to know. That's back to my own review. So. But um, I'm trying to remember now. Just like people's the personal archives. People have been trying to get at my mother's archives, historians, for a long time. She's refused. And I've done so too. But now that I've done the memoir, because at the time I didn't know what I was going to write. It's going to be a history of the It was going to be this, that, and other. I wanted the material to myself. But now I'm more open to people coming and getting these archives to answer other questions, not necessarily the one about whether my father wanted to be a member of the pool or not. But other things that people will ask, I don't files because I don't know I'm going to pursue after research, although it's a constant reference to my own work, particularly sound and sound of sonic memorializations. So I'm interested, I'm more open to it now than before because of it. I guess, how do you get other people to see what they have in their homes as also archival material that they? I, I, yeah. Um, well, it's not a personal thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course. But the closest thing I could contribute to that is writing a memoir, which is about the stuff in your house. Yeah. In fact, there are a lot of things that I discovered in the story that is not actually accurate what I thought and said. But I didn't want to write in this book, she was wrong about the Aburi conference <laughs> for all these important things. So, what you get in the story is I know the histor I know what the historical record says. But what's more important to me is how do these people think that the believe that's what you get in the story. But at the same time, though, there are things that I just were egregiously wrong. I didn't put in the story. Things that my mother thought was not that that did not happen. How do we get people to do it? I think memoirs are really important. I know a number of visual artists are doing Domestic archives, which you like to memory work in general. I know that's happening. So, we have to it. That's probably why I think it's more about my mom than my dad. Thank you. You lose the question. What did you think of the archival? My own archival. 
There's always this vindication. There are things that you need to disprove. There are things you need to clarify. There are things in the record you want to fix. Right? And so that motivated my work as a scholar still does. But to move to the memoir, now some of the sound work doing, it's, it's neither completion or vindication. It's using archival materials to sort of evoke much more evanescent emotional protective responses. Because the emotional response is not something that you really go for as a scholar. You go for more intellectual, theological, arithmetic, it's fine. But one of the big shifts for me is how do you get the archives in terms of beauty, in terms of power? How do you have someone look at the archives? Not just the archives of brutality, but what can you do with that to be more specific about the things? And yes, that sounds manipulative, it's also the artist's So, thanks for the time. Please. Well, okay. I'm just, we're, 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 we're surrounded by turns. <laughs> uh, this is what the turn turn. <laughs> but that is a big shift. It doesn't mean that the archival is wrong. This means with this kind of work at this point, very interesting. Feelings, emotions, just a bug. I just remember those mindful moments, and I can talk about that at the beginning. We don't know where that was either. That moment where he tells me, oh, this racism, this racism is bad, and he forgot to shut up and keep me. <laughs> That was, you know, really jumped up. And I just, I told you, I just spoke to you, and I am not really the next thing. So, so there are those moments, which, is, which was my goal. <laughs> but, you know, listen, you know, I'm not going to say that only black people do this, but I come from the black diaspora, and you've got to get those lines that wants to drive the right effects, right? Whether they're African or Caribbean or black or not, the lines that are like politically incorrect, they're just like, boom, you know? So my uncle was full of voice, and I wanted that voice in there. And but it's also, I hope you see, it's also incredibly beautiful. And then I want to be able to curate these moments. So writer, this is what I have. And even now the work that I'm doing is still deeply archival, but my language is shifting. Other than the venues are shifting it's right now. And you know, looking at uh, you know, right now I'm doing deep archival digging into the history of the US patent, which doesn't sound very interesting, I'm sure it was. But the stuff that I'm finding out there is mind blowing, bizarre, but organized in the right way, staggering moments. To discover, for example, that so many slaves rushed into patent office before the Civil War trying to register the inventions that they were making. And of course, they couldn't be registered. They couldn't get patents. You know why? Because you have to be a person to get a patent. And so to tell the story of people still trying to patent machines that do that, right? but you can't patent, but they keep trying, right? So until somehow the courts have to register at the least that the black people are making these inventions, and they're in the patent office. I just found the story of this one black person who was one of the first black people to work in the US patent office. Yeah? And the reason he's in the patent office is because he was convinced that not enough people know that so many slaves or enslaved people were registering and filing patents. <laughs> and so he gets into the patent office so that he can tell that story and he starts gathering all this information on 
enslaved people in the patents, they get denied by the courts, but he assembles it all and passes it on to people like, you ever heard of Jody Du Bois? There's some Du Bois stuff at the um, Paris, Paris Exposition that's based on this guy in the patent office who we don't know, but he passes on all this information, all the, get a list of all the machines that these enslaved people are working. That's archival. But I want you guys to feel the beauty, the utility, and the power of that. So that's what that's the shift. That's the shift. I was asking, you still distinguish or deny or clarify your artistic work and your intellectual rational work. And you find a way to discuss them as kind of mix of text in the community through your expense of music. Professionally, why do you feel how to, from one side, be a scholar and the other side, be a artist? It's all practical. It's trying to get a job. Uh, <laughs> but I want to ask that though. The truth is, the, the, the truth is, um, I don't. I don't. However, when you put work into the world, others feel the need to. Right? And so you find yourself dragged into a conversation about it is, is it this, is it that, is it this. But I, I've never made that distinction. It's what happens when you get a PhD, you become a professor, you get tenure, you publish press, right? You are sort of legibly seen in a certain way, but then you do something else which might be a challenge that's not just seen as this. But all of this is, that's the external, I don't make any distinction. It's all the same body of work. I've been working sound now, and that for me it's a part of it all. You know, but people say, well, wait a minute, this one's on minstrelsy, and this one's on robotics and AI, and this is how is it connected? But well, if you read it all, you'll see how it's connected. I'm not, I don't have to tell you, you have to read the work. Sadly, they're not reading the work. <laughs> they're looking at your title. So I know it's not a clear, the answer is I don't make those distinctions, but the world around us. Make those distinctions, particularly in the United States. You know, when I just covered up my aspirations, people like, I don't know, I don't know that. And folks who artists, scholars, I mean, are you a scholar or a theorist? That's another thing. All right. How do you define these things? Let the other people struggle with it. And the struggle is to get the word out and put them away from the side. Other folks will have to I think when I was younger, I was caught up in it more because you want to be clear what you are. Time. <laughs> you mentioned earlier how like draft of the label really turned to like how it should be. So how did you find what to do with the not like included things that would be? I'm proud to say I don't regret cutting out the names. And I'm not sure if I'm saying that for the book there. <laughs> But I don't really think I, the reason I probably don't remember is that I like how people like the fact that people are feeling and sensing so much that's not there. Right? And so I think I can do that well. I'm proud of that. I'd say you can it. I like that I did that. Right? How do you tell as much of the story as you can without saying everything? An artistic impulse is really important to me. So. It was difficult, yes, so I went to cut out. Especially when you're dealing with issues of race, you want to constantly clarify, but you have to find new ways. The answer to your question is, what happens when you have a mass of words? You start to sculpt it. A certain point, you have so much. The writers always say, you just have to write enough until the characters start telling their own story. That's real. Start shaping this thing until it has its own logic and its own narrative, then it's telling you more to go. Sounds metaphysical, but it's a real A certain point of narrative dictates its question. So it makes no sense to bring in, you know, oh, I should tell my father's story. Maybe somewhere else, maybe something else. But this thing that was shaping, it's more about that. Final question. All right. 
Yeah, um, it's been so it's somebody like that. <laughs> yeah, it's been um so um talking about beauty first. I know I don't know if you know this, but your essence is the Nigerian cyber crime. Actually, oh, you know this. Yeah, and actually it um features a lot on Nile Land. Yes, that's right. That's right. It was in Nile Land. Yeah, and for me finding Discovery that was surprising because you know, Nyland is considered it was a very you know a prestige among the youth, right? And it's considered like, I mean, the first equivalent is like pretty easy. And um thinking of the experiences in the last four, I'm thinking of you saying that you know you have to grapple with you know, the fact that you're always disappointed, right? And reading that piece and understanding in the context to Nyland, right? Kind of like Shifts that understanding that you are in relation to relation to Nigeria and right? then also to the Africans. So my question is in relation to beauty and form, right? Because yes, there are moments of like you know singular expressions in the memoir, right? That yes, are the beauty of expression, right? But if you think about the entire aspect itself as a form that that elicits this affective response to Nigeria, I know that it's what. That, that elicits a certain kind of affective response, I get translated through circulation of the text you know, across the dialogue. So, my question is one, um, what is your relationship with the form of um, activism that, you know, um, in South East Nigeria kind of, like, you know, is involved in currently? Like, what, what does that relationship look like? like um, and what the other side to that would be, and this is the action of you know, someone who has been in Nigeria and you know, involved in the scenario. What does your relationship with the Nigerian state <laughs> if it's a, if my, if it's a personal question to ask? Um, well, there are, there are different aspects to it because we know you didn't bring this up, but we also know that the new Biafra movement is there, and a lot of it is people my generation, right? Spirit. Nyland and the 419, that piece I'm very proud of, but I also know that a lot of Nigerians read it out. Are you saying that 419s are good? <laughs> Which I think you're suggesting is like a whoa, 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 what's going on? Right? It was kind of taboo. Well, when you you know when you write and your work is sort of seen in diaspora, you don't you have less control over the context. Because I didn't send it to Nyland. They found it, they, they, they published it. I'm glad they did, because it disrupted, as you said, some of the conversations. But if things are popping up in Jamaica or Nigeria or South Africa where stuff like that showed up, I can tell you the stories about how my stuff shows up in South Africa and how I position You have no necessary relationship to the state. My relationship to Nigeria is now strictly through family. I have family there, remittances there, <laughs> I say that, and I'm very close to my family back and forth in parts of Nigeria. Not all of them. Many of them have been disappointed in me. So don't connect with me in the same way. But my relationship with the state is, in many ways, this memoir, my relationship to Jamaica and to Nigeria, there was a level of affective complexity that I felt that I had to grow with this memoir. So I have a relationship to my family, intellectually. I have obligations, I think, to my godfather who passed in the country, but also memorializing the Afra for some work I'm interested in doing there. But the formal state, to be honest with you, I mean, like, my relationship to the formal Nigerian state is prompt, I mean, not like yours. <laughs> the state is this alien presence that is coercive and absurd, but we don't have any human relationship to it. However, I probably will have to invite it. So, so, yeah, absolutely. Can I have a question? It's always true. One of my easy questions. Yeah? Marley or Faye? <laughs> I have an essay that I've been wanting to write. I'm afraid to write. I went to a great yeah. festival some years ago. I to this festival. And at the festival, there was Marley's granddaughter. And Femi. Yeah. And I was engaging with both of them, right? 
And so, and I began to realize, wow, we need to account for not so much Marley and Freyla, but their kids and their grandkids were actually out there doing stuff that's like the Marley estate, right? The Marley estate is so bizarre and possibly corrupt at times that it interferes with my relationship to Marley. Yeah. <laughs> what they do and have done in Jamaica has so turned me off you know, the way that they And they have the right to capitalize on the brand, right? It's part of you know, rolling papers, especially brand marijuana, and they did all these different things that makes perfect sense. Well, yeah, but there are all there are other business ventures that the Marley brand has got into that would be less that things that you're like, Bob well, would never. Yeah. And Femi and um, the other one. Femi, this is Shin. Shin, yeah. They, they so depend on their father's legacy. I would certainly respect, but my experience with them is that they turn that father's legacy against the younger generation of black Nigerian musicians and artists, as if somehow, if you're not aspiring to be like our father, you're no good, right? And so they try to police it. So I find myself dealing with the legacies of these figures, which has impacted my relationship to music. But I couldn't, I, if we strip that, I absolutely couldn't. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't pick one. <laughs> I couldn't pick one of them. They're just so very different, and the stories, of how they come at blackness, which is so interesting. Barley's story, you know, it's biracial figure, the mother, the father, you know, his father, you know, the relationship between him, Bunny, and Peter, and Chris Blackwell. And then Fela discovered his blackness in was Oakland, Sandra Isidore, and Black Panthers. All of that is pretty fascinating. So I don't know what the actors No, I know, I know, I know. Because I can't. Make a choice about the actual music that we do on some stuff. You're begging the question. I'll tell you this so I'll give you mine. Well, before you do that, I deliberately have not listened to either of them. That's how complicated they are. And you're not watching the film. I'm not filming. I'm so no, 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 no. I don't like to see it anytime soon. But I tell people it took me three years to see my brand. So I tend not to see the sleep this year. But yeah, you tell me that. No, I'm not going to tell you. No, I'm not going to tell you. She didn't have a little ish <laughs> Will you tell me a dinner? Babe. You're after being great. I want to know this. <laughs> well, folks, thank you so much. It's Yes, that's what you're <laughs> <laughs>